Uh, good morning again, everybody. Um, I'm Craig Harrison with Chickmaster Service Team. Um, I want to welcome everybody to our 12th Technical Tuesday here at Chickmaster. Um, again, our apologies as to every week that we can't be with you in person, but the hope is that these webinars give an opportunity for us to impart a little bit of knowledge on you and for an opportunity for you to ask questions for us. Today, I've got the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Scott McKenzie. He's a toxicologist and the technical director of live therapeutics at Boehringer Ingen Ingenheim's US Avian Business Division. He's been working with the US poultry sector for over 25 years, developing, evaluating, and optimizing a diverse pathogen management strategies and products primarily for the hatchery and field sanitation, poultry drinking, water disinfectant, gut bacteria management, and biosecurity. He has worked with nearly every US hatchery over the last 13 years to optimize cleaning and disinfecting performance, coupled with egg surface, water, and airspace sanitation. It's an absolute pleasure to hand over him tonight. If you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them through the process of the presentation. Scott, over to you. Sounds, sounds great. All right. <clears throat> Craig, I appreciate the uh, kind introduction and the opportunity to, uh, to speak on this uh, Technical Tuesday. Um, I've, uh, I've been with BI now for about uh, seven months, um, and, uh, but I've spent the majority of my career in poultry uh, so, sort of helping our industry uh, with, with pathogen management. And I'm going to talk broadly about pathogens today, but, but what, I'm, what I will be discussing is both relevant to the, the food safety and the uh, live production avian pathogens that we deal with. Uh, in the hatchery from a sanitation perspective. So, <clears throat> you know, like, like Craig said, I've, I've, I've sort of been bouncing around the U.S. Uh, hatchery uh, sector for about 13 years now, um, working with customers to, to sort of lift up their sanitation programs uh, throughout the United States. And, and, and as a side note here, I will be speaking specifically about U.S. Uh, production here. So to our guests and who are on this webinar from other countries, um, I'll, I'll certainly do my best to answer questions that you have about either chemistry strategies or brands, but know that, that my familiarity uh, is only uh, is limited to, to the U.S. business sector. Um, <clears throat> prior to, to working with the poultry industry, I was involved in research and development of, of disinfectants and decontamination um, in, a, in a very broad sense for, for non poultry and non-avian applications for about two and, a, two and a half decades. And so it was there that I really learned to think about uh, things from a toxicologist perspective and how to dose microbes efficiently with the toxins that are required to inactivate or kill them. There's, there's two parts to today's talk. And our first part uh, is going to be really thinking about the hatchery instead of, um, of what is in the hatchery, uh, but instead of what flows through it. Um, so not the surfaces. I think everybody knows how to clean and disinfect the things that are in the hatchery are surfaces. Um, I'll talk a little bit about chemical classes and I'm, I am gonna skip the simple quats because they're so common, especially in the processing plant, but I will at least reference them a bit. Um, part two, just some trends in the US, some of the good, some of the old bad habits and and really um, just some talk about, about science and selling and how you make decisions for how you're gonna run your hatchery from a sanitation perspective. So what I hope you take home from, from this part one piece anyway is, and I'm gonna talk quite a bit about fogging. And fogging is not a substitute for cleaning and disinfection. It's just one tool that we use for sanitation to enhance our standard sanitation processes of scrubbing cleaning, rinsing, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So fogging is not a substitute, uh, it's, it's a step. Uh, the choice of product chemistry and the different brands are available and the specific details of where, how much you're using, so the concentration, when you use them, you know, strategies like rotation, and then the equipment specific limitations like the dip tank uh, that the US has really embraced for the use at the end of tray washes. Um, these are all critical aspects of sanitation. Um, safety is becoming an important piece, but also consistency and automation of, of sanitation is very important. We need to inspect what we expect. Uh, we'll disinfect the hatcheries today and talk about it as our three flows, not about surfaces. 
I will give you, uh, and the U.S. guys have probably heard me talk about this, there are three questions that I can ask the hatchery manager to predict a clean or dirty hatchery before I even step beyond the, the front office. And then we'll talk a little bit about the chick box. So this is Scott's rule of thumb. Um, you know, we want to spend 80% or four of our five fingers worth of time, uh, four-fifths, talking about cleaning. Um, first, we remove the dirt. Then we wet the dirt with the soap and give it contact time. We also want to wash the broken dirt away and then let the surfaces drip dry, if, if not completely dry, before applying a disinfectant. We talk about disinfectants a lot, but really it should only encompass about 20% of your effort and focus. And there's really just no chemical that can substitute for clean. And I, I just always feel compelled to put this in there because um, it's, it's just the, the rote routine piece of sanitation that is so important. It's the blocking and tackling and a football uh, uh, analogy there for, for, um, for sanitation. So that's, uh, I wouldn't, feel good about going into a presentation if I didn't at least show that. So for 2020, I think at this point that antibiotic-free hatchery uh, has been proven. Um, it wasn't the easiest thing, but it, our hatcheries didn't collapse when we removed genomycin from our Inovo process. Um, you know, a hatchery should be, though, we found clean, decluttered, organized, and automated as best we can to take the human error out of it. Uh, Seven-day mortality still seems to fall within the realm of what the hatcheries can control. We all can agree on three-day, but I think our seven-day is still up in the air for, for discussion. But, but um, because of the way the U.S. Uh, business sector is set up, seven-day uh, is still going to fall partially on the hatchery. I believe still that most hatcheries do not fog enough. Um, it had picked up steadily in you know, 2017 or 18, but has died off a bit. I think, again, because of the labor and the lack of, of really putting in dedicated equipment into at least hallways, um, some of the egg rooms have seen some nice setups. Um, some folks are starting to, to do some fogging or, or some sanitation for air in the vaccine rooms. Chick boxes are still largely ignored, though, um, by, by a lot of integrators. Um, I would say that formaldehyde is still not going away like I originally predicted in the U.S. And I'll just add yet at the end because I do believe formaldehyde's days are numbered. I just would have thought by now we would have found ways around it. In fact, many integrators have found ways around it. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, hatchery water disinfection treatment is a growing trend. Uh, air is not, um, but it certainly does need to grow and fogging is a key to doing that. I think the chick box um, has uh, just really recently become a focus area and largely because it's, I talk about it when I'm in hatcheries um, and some, some companies have, have made some efforts to do, bring chick boxes into the fold of, of sanitation at least twice a week, if not every day. And so that's starting to break through as a, as a trend. So from a, from a theory of three flows, um, you know, a flow is something that's dynamic. Surfaces are static. So the walls, the floors, the, uh, the trays and things, um, those, those are static. They are, they're part of the hatchery. Even though the trays are, are move, moving, they stay in the hatchery. You know, what you're trying to fog and what you need to think about fogging is really um, the, uh, the things that flow through a hatchery. So the eggs that hatch into chicks, um, we treat those with hydrogen peroxide and formaldehyde or combinations of those uh, in, in, our, in our hatchers. The water itself, so especially the humidity water that mostly is being used um, as a reverse osmosis source for our, in our machines um, and the chemical room and washing. So, you know, treating water is becoming more and more important and a growing trend. Air, not so much, but if you think about what flows through a hatchery, it is just like for this coronavirus, you know, and the, um, the, the flow of pathogens and aerosols throughout a hatchery, um, uh, just like being uh, social distancing and, and some of the things that we've seen with wearing masks, bioaerosols uh, can carry pathogens around the hatchery. So air is something that I think we could take some of the lessons we've learned with COVID and apply them to understanding what flows through the air in our hatcheries and strategies to fix that. 
So if you think about what you're fogging, and I ask folks what they're fogging, and they say, well, I'm fogging the hallways. Well, you're, you are, but you're also fogging, you know, other things. And, and, if, and if I, because of all the stuff that I can't get to, so the, the tops of the machines, the tops of the pipes that go through, the electronic boxes, things that I can't really get wet. Um, I keep hearing about uh, aspergillus fogging. I'm trying to get to the, if your target for fogging is standing still, why can't you clean it or, or even replace it at some point? Um, so that's, uh, that's important. Um, to, to, as a concept moving ahead. Um, how do you know if you should fog? Uh, you know, we want to look at our hatch metrics. So besides just our agri-stats numbers, you know, breakouts, air plate counts, um, you know, plating things like our reverse osmosis, as I talk about uh, the need to, to plate reverse osmosis water. Um, they say, why? I say, well, it's so easy. Just, just put it up inside a machine or in a hallway. Of course, we're not at that time of year where we're using a lot of humidity lines, but, but plate the, that RO water and see um, if, if you need to, to do it. Let the data and let the birds and the biology teach you and show you um, what, to, uh, what, to, what to fog or if you should fog at all. Um, I think that a lot of this is, is done as insurance anyway, but if you see hatch numbers that might lend each insight into the need, for example, floor eggs or older flocks where you may need to do a little bit extra, um, that's important. I will say that especially for egg rooms, we found and found out the hard way that temperature of the water um, is important that we don't use water of, with greater temperature difference uh, of 10 degrees Fahrenheit for uh, fogging with the external egg temperature because we get a little bit of thermal shock on those eggs. Uh, let's see. Um, sorry. My computer has... Frozen. Let's see if I can't fix it. Hmm. All right. Let's see. Sorry, folks. There we go. Fogging choice number one, uh, peroxygens. I like to fog peroxygens for a variety of reasons. And peroxygen chemistry can be peroxymonosulfate, which we know as, as um, in the U.S. as Vercon. Peroxy acids, um, parasitic acid would be the number one um, chemistry. Plain hydrogen peroxide, um, whether that has silver or reduced pH or some unique combinations. I like them because they have a broad biocidal activity. Uh, and, and can be sporocidal. Uh, they do have low residual toxicity, which is a good thing for preset or incubating egg, uh, and I like that. Um, it does its job, and then it goes away. It breaks down into harmless byproducts. Just one key piece of information here that um, when you're looking at peroxygens, you do need to store those, and they do come in opaque drums. You shouldn't have translucent drums or containers when you purchase peroxide for your hatchery. But I'm speaking more about your foggers and, and uh, containers where you may do dilution into. You don't want UV to be able to poke through, uh, shine through that because it will break down uh, the, the peroxide. Um, so just keep that in mind. Parasitic acid it is the number one chemistry used in the United States for our carcass rinse uh, and, and carcass chill water in the processing plants. So it's widely available chemistry. It's a unique combination of peroxide and acetic acid or vinegar, and it's in an equilibrium. So it, it, uh, it's constantly a combination of all of these uh, four, four ingredients in the liquid itself, both at diluted and concentrated levels. Um, 
And the breakdown products are simple vinegar, water, and oxygen. So it's, it's kind of nice uh, chemistry. In the EPA uh, registered realm in the United States, there are many brands. Examples would be Parasan A, Parasite, Kino X5, it's Sanidate, and there, there could be others. I apologize if I missed, but there's lots of options for parasitic acid um, for disinfecting and for fogging. Um, What's interesting else about peroxy acids is that they are low pH, so they do have the ability to um, descale. And scale is a combination of the minerals that is, that's in the water, in your water systems, things like calcium, iron, manganese, um, those, the scale that often we see in hatcheries, both on, on nozzles and uh, in, on tray washes and, and systems that are using heated water. Um, Acid can help break those down. Just one warning that if you're using them inside of plumbing systems that can be quite hard on butyl or natural rubber O-rings, actuators, and they can also be tough on brass. So valves that are, that are automatically shutting systems on and off uh, can, can, be, um, can be affected. So we need to make sure to use only the, the, the minimum uh, uh, amount necessary to do the disinfecting. Other acidic peroxygens sold again, uh, there are two solids, um, oxybleach, which is not EPA registered, and peroxy monosulfate. Again, the US, our brand that we have available here is Vercon. Um, there is uh, maybe several other non-parasitic acid peroxide blends with acid and peroxide um, available in the marketplace. I'm aware of one called Intervention from a company called Virox. Um, sold it's 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 found it's kind of niche in, in some vet clinics and swine truck washes but again it's out there and uh it's it's nice chemistry especially i, I like it to use to wipe down eggs uh, for floor eggs and eggs that are visibly dirty for u.s customers um just some pictures of some of the equipment you know you can purchase these uh fogging systems um in the u.s there, uh, there's kinds that have the little tree, the extended nozzles where you can raise them up and help distribute the fog a little bit better. Uh, I like those versus the smaller ones, but some folks have made homemade ones. You'll see in the top left, the, the blue barrel drums. Um, and those are, those are just fine too. Uh, four nozzles usually better than two for those applications. Even uh, the bottom left, there's a picture of some centralized installed systems that simply draw concentrate out and do an automatic dilution. On the far right, the blue small one gallon, four liter um, fogger is uh, used primarily for transportation. So fogging trucks and things like that, some small spaces and even on, on farm egg rooms, um, a little, little brand there, I think is Hurricane Fogger. I believe that's what that one is. Um, those don't do as good a job for large rooms, but certainly for small and close spaces, it's, it's a good option. So we talked a little bit about, uh, about why we don't store peroxide in, uh, in translucent jugs, and it's because they break down by UV light. That's why the peroxide you purchase at the stores come in brown or opaque bottles. Um, it's an old, old chemistry, breaks down into water and oxygen, um, no disinfection byproducts, um, and is likely not acidic or caustic, but it has to be used at, at very high concentrations. I'll give you an example. The bottle there is 3%. 3% is 30,000 part per million. So that's quite a bit to do disinfecting. Um, it does react with everything. Um, and so that's just a consideration uh, for you moving ahead if you're gonna use a hydrogen peroxide for sanitation. Um, it's sold in the US in three concentrations, uh, whether regardless of the size. 50%, there are several brands um, of 50%. There's um, Proxiclean and Siloxicide. Those are the, uh, the two probably most popular that are branded. You can also buy 50%, uh, just technical grade. Uh, more popular concentration are 32 and 34% peroxides. Um, that gets you around some of the Homeland Security concerns with, with having the 50%. So that's gaining in some speed and then there's at least one 5% ready to use concentration uh, that folks use for fogging eggs on, uh, on farms. Um, and again, it's really growth, growing as a use in hatcher disinfectants versus uh, the use of formaldehyde 
Uh, in fact, some companies have even used both. They pulse them either in a sequence or alternate them back and forth. And I, I do have a little bit of concern about doing that versus a sequence. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So I talked about the, the, the hurricane foggers or these small foggers for fogging eggs on farms when that's available. Um, I do like the peroxygen uh, chemistries and, and even uh, parasitic acid. You do have to blend those parasitic acids. There's, there's not um, a, re a ready to use that I'm aware of uh, in the US, um, although I think there's some companies working on that right now, but that 5% RTU um, is available to purchase. Um, I, I've shown an example here of a B&G fogger versus the Hurricane brand um, that has the opaque coloring. And since most farms are gonna probably use that peroxide throughout the week, um, because of the small space, maybe good to think about that. And I've even seen some, some guys um, spray paint these translucent reservoirs at the bottom of hurricane foggers. Anything you can do to keep the light out of them. Um, so back to the hatchery, uh, you know, used to see some ozone generators in this business years ago. Uh, I still see in most hatcheries a UV lamp system that's installed on the exit water from the RO tank before it goes out to the hatchery. And I mean, that's okay, but I will say that the biocidal UV intensity of those purple or UV light bulbs uh, decreases exponentially and fairly quickly in my experience. You know, six months is, is you start to see some pretty significant decay. You should just talk to your your equipment provider about the concerns about that and just have them show you, he or she show you that uh, that decay curve of that lamp. Um, just because the purple light is on doesn't mean that it's working or doesn't mean that it was working as well as it was maybe a few weeks or months prior. Also, um, the UV lamps were designed to be on a recirculation loop so that they're constantly doing their job. The UV lamp doesn't put chemistry into, uh, it, it doesn't put much chemistry into the water. Um, it's just designed to, to break uh, DNA and, and through just shining the light through the water. So really you want continuous uh, treatment uh, with that water going through a recirculation loop. I like adding either chlorine or peroxygen chemistry into RO water. You don't need much um, for chlorine, which is the most common one to three part per million. Uh, should do it most of the time. Some hatcheries have started a little bit higher because they know they've got a built up biofilm in their uh, RO water. Uh, you know, you can, you can actually add bleach manually and pour it into the RO. Uh, that's a lot of work. I don't like that method um, because it does take more than you think when you do the dilution of, of bleach. You can also meter in something like um, chlorine dioxide or sodium chloride with acid to, uh, to turn that into chlorine dioxide on its way out into the hatchery, or you can use a hypochlorous acid uh, tablet. Um, these, these solid bleach tablets, there's one that's got adipic acid in it, it's kind of nice, um, and uh, to the RO water to, to achieve, again, that one to three level. Because you have to remember, the RO water is removing all the chlorine, all the iron, all the, the, the molecules from water to give you really pure water. But in the US, it's also removing the chlorine that you're getting from the city water supply or your rural water supply, the water tower. So when you remove the chlorine, you remove the protection. So we're adding chlorine or some other chemistry in instead of UV light to protect that humidity water that's going to go and be on those eggs. Again, think about it like a COVID sneeze throughout the hatchery that bioaerosol is going to carry bacteria unnecessarily uh, throughout the hatchery. So it's just another tool in the toolbox. So I'll switch gears here to our aldehydes. Uh, again, I'm gonna skip quats, but I'll talk a little bit about the aldehydes. So formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde are the two aldehydes we use in the United States. They can be sporicidal and fungicidal at the right concentrations. Normally that is not what's listed on the labels for these chemistries. Um, wide, broad germicidal activity, which is good. Uh, they do decent in the presence of organic matter. So things like after the tray wash um, is a good place for it. Um, you know, places where things are going to be fairly dirty, like in hatch halls and in set halls. 
Um, a little bit of residual activity due to both the quat and the aldehyde. Just want to mention here that formaldehyde was was designated by IARC as a as a suspected human carcinogen. Um, so that's really changed the way that that we view and have had to deal with formaldehyde in our hatcheries uh, and as it relates to personal protective equipment, health monitoring, and compliance with OSHA regulations. Again, I thought that formaldehyde would be on its way out, but its simplicity and cost have, have allowed it to stick around at least for a bit. You see the two molecules here. Obviously, the single carbon is the gas formaldehyde. Uh, it wants to be a gas. And then the double uh, aldehyde group, there are two oxygens. That is the chemical structure of glutaraldehyde, and it, and it kills by cross-linking. Uh, like a spider web. So formaldehyde is a gas. Uh, it really doesn't want to be in the water. It's sold to you and you purchase it in a hatchery at 37%. And that is the saturation level of water uh, in water and uh, which you buy uh, from your distributor, uh, whomever it is, you need a four by one gallons or drums, mostly four by one gallons is what we sell in the US. Um, no one really uses paraformaldehyde. Uh, I think other countries might, but uh, we really don't even have time many, many, many times in the U.S. to do a good job of sanitation, so please don't get in the habit of making your own formaldehyde. Uh, it's dangerous, generates heat, and you really need to do it in a fume hood. Glutaraldehyde um, is, uh, is an alternative uh, that's not uh, carcinogenic. Uh, it is sold actually slightly acidic to uh, prevent clogging and agglomeration in, in the jug. Um, a few words about formaldehyde. It is a gas phase, and so the importance is that that efficacy depends on the moisture available to the egg or the surfaces you're trying to disinfect it, and also the retention time. This becomes a challenge in our in our hatch cabinets because we have so much air moving through them. Um, you know, being a gas, you don't have to fog formaldehyde. You just can drip it down a wick. You can pour it on the ground. Wherever it goes, it's going to begin degassing very quickly. And as you learned from the earlier math, 37% is the same as 370,000 part per million. Um, glutaraldehyde is a uh, non-carcinogenic aldehyde option um, uh, for, for the US. I wouldn't fog more than once or twice a day uh, in, your, in your hallways and, and certainly less is more. Um, the use of formaldehyde, uh, really jumped when we went antibiotic free and pulled genomycin from these hatcheries, but it's certainly not been a predictor of three or seven day mortality. It is duct tape, it can help, uh, but not a silver bullet, uh, and has to be part of a good sanitation program. Um, it can help lift up a bit things like old flocks, dirty eggs, uh, poor hatch of fertile a little bit, not really, um, but. I've seen a little bit of evidence of that, but certainly in, in some poor incubation uh, scenarios. Um, it can burn tracheas if overdone, so the last pour, last application is critical. Um, the formaldehyde is just one small useful tool, but if, if I were running a hatchery or a live production manager, I would certainly be thinking about a plan B in case formaldehyde does go away. The use of formaldehyde and hydrogen peroxide in combination has also gained a little bit of traction. I'll just mention here that um, with uh, the use of our water specifically, um, that formaldehyde is oxidized uh, to formic acid uh, very quickly um, with peroxide if the peroxide is still present on the eggs or the trays or fan blades or, or whatever. Um, and it's going to be concentration and time dependent too. So I would. Uh, well, I, I do get some, some, some positive feedback from the field that uh, the, the pulsing and, uh, of, of combining formaldehyde and peroxide uh, s seems good. Uh, I like to see good gaps of time between the two so that they individually they can do their chemistry and then it won't cancel each other out. Better to do them in a sequence, all, all in a sequence versus um, uh, doing, going back and forth frequently. Um, there is a long history of fogging quats and the glute quat blends uh, that are uh, out in the market. Um, you know, the history of, of a product called BioCentury 904, uh, which was a simple quat with 1% tributyl 10 oxide. And the TBTO was in there just for uh, fungus control, mold control. Um, 
there was, uh, um, you know, a pretty uh, successful history of that. That product is no longer on the market. And so we're, we've leaned heavily on the glutaraldehyde quat blends to substitute for that, at least in our hatch halls, especially after transfer um, for additional treatment along with formaldehyde or peroxide. There are three glucoat blends in the United States sold, uh, Synergize, um, Viracid, and Glutex GQ1 are the three that come to mind. There's also a 20% straight glutaraldehyde called Glutex GS2 that's also sold in the United States. So those are your four glute options. Um, the concentration uh, that have been in the past common are one to two ounces per gallon. Um, 904 in the past was fogged at higher levels, but lower uh, for higher exposure to eggs because they, they have a tendency to clog pores if they're overdone. I will mention here that for your health and safety uh, departments that fogging labels are gonna be and have been in a sharp decline in the US. EPA just use it as a hot potato. You're gonna see less clear instruction for fogging uh, disinfectants moving ahead due to both the PPE and the hurdles that EPA and OSHA have, have placed by either being silent or not allowing those claims to be added. Um, I, I, I wish they were on there and I'm glad to see the ones that still have them, but I think it's gonna be a, a greater hurdle uh, even ahead, moving ahead after 2020. So I mentioned Asper here, uh, Aspergillus that we, that we can fight, see and break out sometimes. Uh, Fumigatus is the particular Aspergillus that's uh, tough on chicks respiratory system um, is not a bacteria so it's much much bigger um, and uh, and again is is really something that uh, likes to move through the air in a hatchery either on contaminated eggs uh, rotten eggs uh, so so things like storing your coals are, are rough um, and I will just say that a little bit of chick down that's contaminated can contain a ton of aspergillus spores uh, they only require three things, heat, moisture, and something cellulosic to grow on, like wood, paper, or wet cardboard. So you always have to watch those in your, in your hatcheries. Um, there is one product that is sold specifically uh, to, to uh, help control aspergillus, and that's Clinifarm. Its use has been a bit of a pendulum in the US with product coming in and out of the marketplace. There are two formats, the SG smoke generator uh, and the emulsifiable concentrate. Um, I'm not sure of the latest status on its availability, but one or both of these are uh, back in the US. There, there are label updates that, that come and, and you'll see changes, again, much more conservative than you've seen in the past as far as use both for hatcheries and in fogging applications. Um, while there are dis some disinfectants that do have Aspergillus fumigatus on the label, uh, Clinifarm only has Aspergillus species on the label, no bacteria, no viruses. So it's, it's not a, a broad disinfectant, but it is a good tool if you are combating uh, Clinifarm and can't gain that control with the use of conventional disinfectants. Uh, back in the day, it was commonly used as a tank mix with several non-oxidizing disinfectants like quats, aldehydes, and phenols, but that language is now missing on the current labels. Um, and uh, I just throw that out there for those guys who have been in the industry for a long time. Um, I would caution you that the understanding of when aspergillus is on a label, uh, you need to ask the manufacturer if that was the spore, spore form of the aspergillus or the active hyphae of aspergillus because most of the time in a hatchery we're dealing with spores. Um, and I, I just say that uh, again, uh, we, we do see some, some bump ups in, in spore and, and mold concentrations late summer, fall, but wet wood, cardboard, or paper in hatcheries are usually the culprit. Um, hypochlorous acid. Uh, has also gained some traction uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. Uh, the most commonly generated uh, HOCLs are uh, in, in machines that take salt and electrolyze it into an analyte and a, and a uh, catholyte. Uh, they're neat little machines, but remember it is pH dependent if you're gonna be doing any kind of dilution, um, which I don't think you should. Uh, I don't remember fogging it because of the um, of the corrosive nature of it. In fact, uh, the chick master uh, sent a document out to me uh, this morning uh, and recommended that acidic uh, 
chlorines like uh, HOCl and, and hypochlorous acid, uh, sodium hypochlorite, not be used because they are damaging to some of the galvanized metallic materials in, in hatchers. So um, uh, uh, it does have a place uh, in the hatchery, make, makes a great dip tank or even foam disinfectant. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of thermofogging disinfectants. I won't dwell on this because this is more of a farm thing, but I know some countries do uh, thermal fog disinfectants. The US data that I've seen shows only directional killing. Um, it's just a concentration uh, and numbers game uh, and also sampling game uh, that, that I'm, I'm just not convinced yet. Um, I'll just mention here that, that you know, when we deal with disinfectants, we're dealing with poisons, toxins, and that's their job. I am a toxicologist, so that's the angle that I come at. You can't have a very deadly kill bacteria and viruses and also be completely safe for your lungs or your eyes or your skin. It's, it's, it's a bit of a conundrum to see that. Uh, and so I, I, I just caution you to think about concentrations of, of the different chemicals you're using. Everything can be safe or toxic likely at a certain concentration. It's the concentration and dose that, that makes the poison. So three questions, I'll switch gears here to every hatchery uh, manager has to know the answer to, especially if you're running an ABF hatchery. And I can ask these before I even go to the back. And then the first is, what's the minimum part per million of the disinfectant and what brand are you using uh, after your spray bar or your dip tank? And in the disinfectant form we're using your hatch halls. And then can we walk to the back and show me the part per million is acceptable right now? And that's a good, that's a good thing to know. You should know that as a hatchery manager, hatchery superintendent. Number two is describe to me the process you used to clean the hatchers every day. And if you describe that process and we go in the back, is that what I'm going to see? The tools, the scrubbing, the soap, the foam quality, and the disinfectant uh, that we're using. And then can we see the cleaning and show me that that's what, that's what we're going to get? The third question is, what is the detailed process to control pathogens in the three flows? So the hatchery, air, the eggs, themselves and the water, especially RO water, and how can you show that to me right now with a with a, uh, a dipstick or some sort of part per million tool to, to measure? And if you can do these three things, you're going to be able to answer those questions as they come to you from not not from me, but from your your own live production management and veterinary staff. They used to look at shoes and boots to see what kind of uh, traction people, folks had in the back of the hatchery, but but with AgriStats, you know being so tough on folks these days, I've, I've sort of don't look at shoes so much. I think the bottom line here is that you do have to care about sanitation. It is not one of the highlight pieces of our hatchery. It's the every day, do it the same way all the time pieces of the business. Um, it's not exciting. We don't hear enough promotion of sanitation from a lot of suppliers in the US because its profitability has gone down and resources have become more limited to be completely transparent. Um, I think too that it's a labor and communication issue a lot of times um, and constantly thinking about the HR issues in a hatchery and how to train and teach and follow up. But again, we have to inspect what we expect if we're gonna make sure sanitation is done properly. Uh, a simple tool, kit that I carry around, just some of the pH uh, and uh, concentration meters, uh, quick test strips. You can measure just about anything with a quick test strip. You don't need fancy equipment. So what I hope you take home today is that fogging is not a substitute for standard cleaning and disinfection. It's a supplement. Uh, the choice of the chemistry is all about concentration, temperature, target, and frequency. Uh, having uh, safety is important, but also you have to use the part per million of a chemistry that's going to do its job with the organic load that it's being presented. Uh, know the answers to the three questions that I've shown you, and then from the hatchery, uh, treat it as three flows, not just the things you can clean and not just the fixed surfaces. And then I'll bring up the chick box a little bit here. You know, I don't know what happened in the U.S. It's 13 years ago when I first started really spending a lot of time in hatcheries. Chick boxes were cleaned every day or at least every other day, Saturdays and Wednesdays. Uh, or a lot of chick paper was used back then. So they'd use it on Monday, flip it over, and then use the clean side on Tuesday. I just don't see that anymore. I see dirty chick boxes maybe cleaned on Saturdays, maybe every other Saturday. 
and the logic is you're just going to be put on use chicken litter in a few hours. And, and you know, I, I just don't understand that we've got these super sanitized patch trays that indeed are getting incubated and pathogens are growing in hatchers, but then we put them on filthy chick trays, vaccinated them, and then introduce at a very early point in that chick's life, but to the gut and potential food. And, you know, you're, you don't have a protective feed, direct fed microbial in there. So I think when we start talking about seven-day and three-day mortality, uh, yeah, these are things that can impact that. Um, you know, I don't know what's happened uh, uh, in the chick box, but we've taken, you know, essentially uh, a, a, a well-defined process for hatch trays. We dump the hatch trays, do the separator, count them, and then put them in a chick box that's filthy. Um, it's kind of like giving a chick a second live dose of an oral vaccination that's going to then begin to compete for gut immune resources. And that's going to hurt your numbers moving ahead. That's my opinion. Um, if we won't clean and disinfect the chick boxes, there's an alternative, right? And we do have some customers out there looking at ways to do a quick non-wetting disinfecting step for chick boxes after they clean them. But if you can't beat them, join them. Um, I think uh, to look at, and I'm working on this now, looking at giving the chick an oral gut dose to compete against pathogens in those first critical few hours is an alternative to killing bacteria to compete with and populate them with good bacteria. Um, I'll, I'll run through these real quickly. I know we're running sh a little bit uh, short on time, not too bad here. Um, uh, the dirty belt in the chick processing room is really uh, very often a point of failure for plating. And I don't really know why, except I think a lot of, a lot of cleaning crews tend to shy away from and have gotten in trouble for, for pressure washing some of the uh, electronic equipment that maybe isn't sealed perfectly. Um, you know, the belt itself is heavy. Uh, it's difficult to, there's lots of nooks and crannies underneath it. Um, I think I would, I would prefer to see uh, crews clean the entire belts, leave, do the whole surface, leave them for 10 minutes, then run them again, and then do the other surface, do a lot of cleaning on those belts because they just continuously fail uh, contact plating with Rodak plates. Uh, the other uh, thing is exploders. Uh, during an OVO vaccination, uh, and certainly during uh, uh, the transfer process and even in incubation. Um, and then fluff removal is really hurting some of our air flows and leaving doors open uh, during, during uh, transfer and even during pull uh, that don't need to be open is, is, is a continued concern. Um, I think that, the, again, we think about bioaerosols from exploders. If you think about uh, using a, a more recent COVID-19 uh, example, it's kind of like an egg sneezing and spreading it, uh, disease all throughout that machine. So uh, any tool you can use, clear egg removers have, have done great. Uh, aggressive fogging, disinfecting of floors and incubators, um, again, keeping doors closed. Uh, so, so I think a few oh, more take homes. So Scott, just to back up onto that last slide, whilst we're talking sure. about exploding eggs, there's a question from Mustico. Um, he says, for, for old flocks, what are the suggestions for minimizing exploding eggs? Is there anything you can really do to combat that? Well, the, the, the only, uh, for older flocks, we do see some companies putting those uh, 50 plus weeks on the bottom. Um, it's That's a Band-Aid, but it's not bad. Um, we're also seeing uh, some uh, companies that are without clear egg removers, not uh, punching holes in those older flocks of 50 weeks or older. So those are the only two things that I'm aware of, um, you know, besides obviously increasing your hatch of fertile um, that you can do to prevent exploders and at least mitigate a bit uh, the impact inside your incubators. Perfect. Thank you. Hope that answered the question. Yep. Um, so uh, again, Airflow into um, our our uh, our hatchery from the outside, you know, getting cooled down, getting dehumidified. Uh, for those that aren't using, um, uh, you know, uh, swamp cooler type type setups, uh, you know, and our evap coolers, uh, certainly uh, 
very few evap coolers are, are out there in hatcheries. Still some in our in our tray wash room and even the separator rooms, and that's that's okay if you're going to leave them. That'd be the place to leave them. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of air conditioning been added over the last decade. Um, you know, we talk about sanitizing air. We don't really do a lot of sanitizing air, and I think really it's because of that uh, exposure to the humans. We're not just sanitizing air, we're sanitizing air, we're breathing. So we have to, to do some cleaning and disinfecting uh, of the air without impacting our, our workers. Um, you know, a, a story, colleagues, when the law changed in the United States about, about colleagues and farms, a lot of colleagues have been seeing that second day in the hatchery over the weekend, some things uh, that extend those, those store times. I think there's room for innovation and doing some new things to uh, improve uh, certainly a, a point source for uh, bacterial contamination, even, uh, even again, bioaerosols for, for coal eggs. So uh, I, I get asked a, quite a bit about rotating disinfectants. And, and for the US, I think it's become a bad idea. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. And it's simply this. If it's hard or different or requires a lot of thought, planning, uh, following up, it really gets done incorrectly way too often. Uh, technically, I'm not against it, but from a practical standpoint, hatchery sanitation has to be simple, the same way, managed every day. So if you're gonna rotate disinfectants, then who's gonna do it? And that person has to be the hatchery manager or hatchery superintendent. Or are you willing to pay for a service to come in and do that automatically for you? Uh, that's another consideration. Um, I like uh, doing uh, cleaners, rotating cleaners, if you see scale. A lot of uh, scale buildup on uh, farm racks, uh, trays themselves, you can start to see this. Uh, your tray washer, the hot washers, you can see scale build up on those. I do think it's a good idea to rotate an acidic cleaner into those situations, either weekly or one week a month. Um, you know, a lot of folks will do some of this uh, machine descaling on Wednesdays or on non-hatch days, uh, again, depending on how bad they are. I like keeping the disinfectant at the tray wash the same, but you can rotate disinfecting hatchers. Again, it's not a technical barrier, it's a timing barrier and getting it right. Empty drum syndrome uh, is getting worse, unfortunately. I walk up to drums all the time and see broken pumps, busted pumps, turned way down pumps. Somebody got chewed out for chemical cost. Busted tubing, tubing spraying all over the walls, broken float filters, filters covered with, with uh, fluff, you know. And it, in the last two years, it's really gone, gone down, I think. And, and a lot of hatchery managers just seem tired. I mean, they look exhausted when I point this out, like, yeah, no, you know, darn it, I, I try to get it done, but the number one challenge we have in the U.S. is a people problem. It's not a chemical problem. You can't solve it by buying a different product. It's by having labor that shows up every day on time, sober, rested, ready to work. And that's just a reality of, of 2020. Um, with the stronger influence of safety, of departments, environmental sustainability, all these begin to be to play a role in, in empty drum syndrome. So just keep an eye on that, guys. Uh, tray washes, um, lots have converted to dip tanks. It saves money and you do get better performance, but just uh, really uh, using the float tanks are not as good as using a timer. Um, uh, a lot of folks will use a third or fifth gen quat or even a glutaraldehyde quat blend, but uh, don't use the cheap per gallon stuff. Use something that's a, a half ounce per gallon for the US getting that dark green color, 800 to 1,000 part per million on the tray. I mean, you can, you can put that, that quad test strip inside the spray just to see, make sure it's there, but where you need to test it is on the tray. Um, even hypochlorous acid is fine. I guess most of the machines I see only use 200 parts per million hypochlorous acid. The quads that we use in our industry, uh, here's just some examples of those. Um, there's the part per million uh, of those and, and really, uh, uh, different combinations that are that are used. Um, I think that uh, uh, you know the the level of of a thousand eight hundred to a thousand is good. Um, Glutex GQ one is a little bit different product because it's got a ton of glutaraldehyde in it, uh, so it doesn't need that high level of quat. But 
my, my challenge is that, that are you really getting that five log reduction? And there's a, there's a manuscript here that suggests that, that you're not. Um, clean water is better for your, for your uh, dip tanks if you're gonna use this hypochlorous acid. Make sure you get good flow through. Uh, use that, that liquid uh, concentration. Change it out often, plumb it right in. There's a workaround for it. Um, just don't need to be using uh, uh, dirty water in, those, in that dip tank. Um, uh, again, uh, sodium hydroxide in those machines are not a finished soap, but it's only the one ingredient. My analogy is kind of like eating brownies made out of only sugar. A, a true soap is multiple ingredients to do a good job of cleaning. Um, I do like HCOL, the concept, and I think it needs a little bit of refinement. There are some improvements that can be done with some additives, and I think it can work okay for you. Um, some of the good sanitation trends to end up the presentation here. Um, uh, some dry hydrogen peroxide, there's some innovation uh, uh, out there on that, photocatalytic systems, which is uh, uh, the basis for it. Electrostatic spraying of disinfectants, so super low volume, but high contact uh, style of, of application of disinfectants is, is nice. Uh, combination chemistries uh, with EPA registered foot pan powders has really helped up the, uh, the game there for, for biosecurity. Um, fogging eggs before set, uh, I think is gonna be something that's gonna grow. And um, as, as we continue down this path of, of using less chemicals, um, and using less harsh chemicals. Looking beyond formaldehyde to the future is part of that, uh, uh, using less harsh chemicals. Using a dip tank with a timer, not a float valve, is important. Um, I've, I've been happy to see a lot of folks have rerouted their condensation from the hot washers, the tray wash, the box washer, around the machines down to the floor drain instead of back into that due to pseudomonas control. So uh, good job, guys, for those who've done that. Um, uh, Final slide here, uh, I don't really like rotating chemistries, cleaners maybe yes, disinfectants mostly no, but I do like to see a diversity, some multiple uh, hurdles in between. But there's, you know, again, I've talked a lot about disinfectants today, but nothing can disinfect a filthy egg. Um, if uh, the question on, on old eggs, I mean, this is not necessarily an old egg, but if you start with the rough egg, you're, 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 already, uh, you're already backed into the corner, so. With that, uh, uh, Craig, I appreciate the opportunity. I think I've still got a couple minutes for questions and um, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much for that, Scott. Uh, so there are, there are a couple of questions and um, some of them are fairly specific. So uh, uh, we'll see if we can get through them. So there's, the first one is, uh, is, is Clini Film, uh, sorry, Clini Farm, is it still available on the market? It's one of the products you mentioned earlier on. So in the US, <laughs> So I've, I've not been in distribution now for seven months. So my short answer is I don't know. Um, my gut tells me last I've heard was one of the two forms were um, either the smoke generator or the emulsifiable concentrate. But to be honest, I cannot recall which uh, for the US. Um, I know that um, we're fighting to keep that product available, but it's gonna be tougher and tougher moving ahead uh, with just EPA wanting to continue to limit um, our, our available inventory for protection of the environment. And that's, that's just the reality. Perfect. Good question. I'll, I'll find out, why don't I find out Craig and I'll, uh, I'll put it on the answers uh, that we're gonna formulate here for tomorrow. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so yep. we'll come back specifically um, to the, to the, the um, attendee that asked that question. Yes. Uh, second question is specifically on the older flocks with the thinner eggs. Is there anything that you would do differently on, on concentrations to disinfect them, or is it the same depend, uh, no matter on the age of the flock? You know, the only other thing that I've seen uh, some, some integrators trying is to actually do some physical, I'll call it washing, but wash, disinfect washing of older flocks specifically as they come into the egg room. Um, uh, again, I, 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 you know, our turkey guys out there wash every egg that comes in. And I know the, the membranes uh, cuticles are much thicker. I think it depends on your breed. I would talk to your, um, your, your uh, genetics provider on their advice for um, washing, disinfecting, even with a pump up sprayer, just those those buggies that come in with older flocks, if you know you're gonna have contamination issues with those. Um, I think some of the egg room fogging strategies have, have helped um, lift up 
the performance of some of those older flocks. Um, I was sort of pleased to see a lot of older flocks being culled because of COVID, but I know we're going to be back in um, in that situation soon. So it's a, it's a good question. Um, not many strategies other than what I've already mentioned, but uh, there are a few things you can do. Right, perfect. There's, a, there's a, cust a customer here as well who's got a problem with aspergillus in their hatcher rooms. And they said at the moment they're doing cleaner farm smoking, but they're still having a high contamination rate. Is there anything else that they could do to re rectify that? Yeah, so clinic farms and your hatch halls, uh, smoke generators tend to be better used in small spaces. Um, duct work uh, out of the separator room is a spot that, uh, that has had good success inside incubators and inside machines is really the, the, the size that those products were designed for. If you're going to be uh, uh, not able to physically clean the places where you believe the spores are hiding. So vacuuming and disinfecting tops with um, a disinfectant that has Aspergillus fumigatus on the label, I think is a great strategy. Um, fogging with emulsifiable concentrate. Um, and I'll just say that in the past, people have used tank mixes of certain chemistries that I've mentioned earlier. It's not on the label now. So I would, I would encourage you to ask your health and safety officer uh, if that's okay to do, that's another strategy to combine disinfectant with amazolil. Um, but I, the smoke generators are for small spaces. The emulsifiable concentrate, which is a wet uh, process at 1% by volume, is a better strategy using several foggers for large spaces. Perfect. So next question is, um, is any related to the previous one, is any guidance on the cleaning of the fluffy hatcher tops? And, and purely from a mechanical point of view from Chickmaster, um, is, as you've already touched on, we, we absolutely recommend regular cleaning of that. So vacuuming the tops of the machines to make sure that that fluff isn't getting into the motors, your solenoids, your damper motors in the controls as well. Um, but once you've got past that, um, there's, a, there's a question on disinfecting that as well. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, just disinfecting it, um, you know, a, I think that the challenge I see with, with hatchers and the tops is that they're, they're pretty much horizontal, so you don't get good drainage. Um, you know, if you're going to use a foamer to, to foam disinfect, um, that's fine. I would use a squeegee after 10 or 15 minutes and just squeegee the rest back down the hall and then rinse it down the drain. Um, if you if you would prefer having a portable foamer or even a pump up sprayer because only because it's a horizontal surface, a pump up sprayer with a, just a smaller volume of disinfectant. Uh, I, I think with, with, uh, after you clean them, you can use just about anything uh, to clean those tops. Uh, wiping down the pipes is another key area, electronics and boxes. Um, it's just been a lot of folks that are that are using Wednesdays and, and Saturdays and any extra labor hours you can get to climb around on top of those and clean them. But uh, they're horizontal, so you, you do have to be a bit cautious on how much disinfectant you use on those tops. That's why a lot of folks will dry vacuum and, and uh, just wet mop them instead of uh, foam and use the pressure washer from the hallway. Yeah, but it's also very important to keep the top seam machines clean outside of disinfectant purely because it enables you to see any leaks on the water system far more readily, um, which is something that can save you a lot of heartache in the long run when it comes to preventative maintenance. Uh, ne next question we've got um, is, does PAA affect uh, hatchery sensors at all? Um, and I'm not sure what PAA is. I'm hoping it makes sense to you, Scott. Yeah, but parasitic acid. And, and does it affect hatchery? What was the, what was the word? Uh, hatchery it, sensors, so the, the field devices, temperature, humidity sensors, that sort of thing. I, I suppose yeah. the answer, the question is, is it kind of be damaging to them? So, great question. Um, uh, I've it, look, it it, it it is corrosive. Okay, and and I I won't I won't back off. I, I mean, I won't I won't point you in the in the to a feeling that it is not corrosive. Um, less is more, like I said. Um, anytime you can target uh, surfaces is better than if you're going to non -tar not target surfaces. Um, I don't know if the equipment manufacturers for those environmental sensors where a small amount of analyte is taken in, and usually those are based on conductivity measurements um, uh, or optical, I guess, either one. 
I feel a little better about the optical ones and conductivity over time. Um, it's a great question um, and sort of combated uh, the, the different companies. I've not seen problems with uh, pressure uh, systems, but humidity, um, if they're not just a sealed solid state probe, you, you can, um, you know, it can be pretty tough. We have had a handful of customers over the years where they've been using high concentrations of especially formaldehyde inside the hatches and they've had a, an issue of corrosion on the on the PT100 probes that we use for both temperature and wet bulb humidity. Um, but that, that tends to be when they're running exceedingly high humidity inside the machines as well as the that formaldehyde fogging. Um, so it's something to bear in mind when, you, when you're choosing your disinfectant program for, the hatch, for your machines, for your hatchery, is just to double check what the manufacturer of those chemicals recommend with regards to machines um, and the materials yep. in use. Moisture is corrosive by itself, right? Water is, is corrosive and, and anything you add to water is just going to increase it. Absolutely. Inside an incubator is the perfect environment to make things uh, corrode and uh, we, we don't help it. Uh, so the last question here that we've got is sometimes we're observing fungus is growing in unhatched eggs um, after the hatch breakout, but we didn't see it at candling. Um, how come it's growing in the hatcher and not the setter? Is that, is that something that's within your expertise? Not really. I, I that's interesting question. Um, so, you know, obviously a, a dead, that embryo that that is did not explode um, or did not uh, maybe late dead. I, I, I guess if I understand the question right, Craig, um, and may, maybe I don't, um, but that that you d we don't see in breakouts a lot of mold that came before, let's say, an 18-day transfer. But after 18-day transfer, um, you know, there you're getting moldy eggs at either I guess in the separator room. That's kind of my assumption. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer um, of why that would be a, a late dead mold challenge. Um, well, so there's, there's a small handful of questions that we unfortunately run out of time to before we've got to today. So what we'll do is for those individuals, re we'll reach out to you after this webinar um, and we'll answer you on a more personal level. The, um, as normal, the record, full recording of this webinar will be on our website by the end of this week. Um, yeah, and if anybody's got any follow-up questions or any clarifications they would like from this webinar, please feel free to reach out to support at chickmaster.com and we can get, get back to you. Um, and again, I'd just like to thank everybody for turning up and especially to you, Scott, for, for your time today. Um, My pleasure. It's valuable for everybody else as it has been for me. Thank you.